Hey Red Eye. Hey Red Eye. I'm Dessa, and I'm from uh, I'm from Doom Street in Minneapolis, and I'm here to talk about art and music and birthdays. Uh, and you spent a lot of time in Chicago recently. Uh, one of those times was at La Palooza when I saw yeah. you and Doomtree perform. That was my favorite show of the whole weekend. Thanks. So incredible. How did you feel like that went? You know, I, they were like exciting. I mean, you have like kind of two parts of your mind, at least I, two parts of my mind when I'm on stage. One is like the part that's performing. And then the other voice that I wish I could shut off a little more was like, how is this going? <laughs> you know? Um, and so I think at, at Lollapalooza, it's particularly hard to shut that voice off because mm -hmm. you're, you know, it was a big opportunity for us or where, you know, how many people are there and to look like an idiot on the Jumbotron. And, uh, <laughs> you didn't. Uh, so I think it felt good. I mean, it, it felt like high stakes, you know, to, in my body in the moment, I was, I was nervous and excited, I guess, probably in equal measure. Did the group yeah. kind of talk afterwards? We did. Like was... We do. A lot of times we always say the same thing. Like Sims is always like, yeah. And, and. P.O.S. Steph is always like, cool, man, that was good, you know, and then Mike and I get real sulky if we don't think it was so well, and, um, and Zeus is like, cool, and goes being, you know, but, <laughs> but I, feel like, I feel like you could, you could loop that, it's like Groundhog Day of show recap really? almost every show, yeah. So it wasn't like, oh, man, we absolutely killed it, that well, was... I think there are always, there's always a cohort of people in Doomsday who are like, we slayed it, you know, even if we just, like, filled up the gas tank, like, oh, you know, that <laughs> gas tank is not empty. Totally full. Just totally full of gas. Um, <laughs> and, and they're right. I mean, we did, we did a good job and it felt good. And then, you know, I'm like, occasionally the wet blanket is like, well, I would have liked it if we'd, you know, <laughs> practiced those choreographed dance moves or more, whatever. Well, when I saw you guys, I walked over from Chief Keef's performance. Yeah. Are, how familiar are you with Medium. kind of this new rise of Chicago rap and what do you think of, of what you've heard? Medium. I mean, Chief Keef, you know, I, I think probably I associate him as much as I do a musician with like the political implications of, of what he's rapping about or the social implications, you know, the pitchfork drama, the, the episode of like beef with Lupe. Right. Um, I guess I think a lot about what the social obligations are, if anything, of any, um, of being a, a performing artist. And so I probably spent more time thinking about what Chief Keef means than I have like listening to his music, to be totally honest. And, and where do you, how do you feel about that then? Yeah, I think it's, I think I'm still deciding exactly where I land, but I know that, um, I do think that music has agency. I think it informs the way we think, even if we're not aware of the influence it's having on us in real time. And that doesn't mean you have to lead Sunday school with every 16 bar. That would be a very boring. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like sex, drugs, anger, angst, and pulp are important parts of music. Um, that said, I don't think it's the case that um, an artist can remove his or herself from any moral conversation by saying it's just art. As if that by virtue of being art, it doesn't have a social implication or mm -hmm. social value or social consequence. Well, of course, the tour uh, that you're kicking off tonight is with a full band, whereas recently yeah. you were touring uh, and doing kind of more spoken word monologue type yes. stuff. How does that change your preparation uh, just for what you're doing on stage? Mm. You know, I do, I, I perform so much more frequently as a musician than I do as a spoken word poet or as a monologist. I never say that word out loud <laughs> I don't know where the accent goes, monologist, mon monologist, but um, I don't do that very often. <laughs> That's a hard one. It is hard. And uh and so that took an incredible amount of preparation. I mean, just, yeah, like, get, leave the venue here, you know, go to my hotel room and continue to prepare and then practice in the car on the drive and think about, is there a better timing that I could use or is there some other metaphor I could use to better express a particular theme? Because a lot of it's sort of like, a, it's plastic. I know where I have to land, mm -hmm. but I don't have to get there in a particular way every night. There's just certain plot points that must be hit for the same, for so the thing at the end. So you're doing some rewriting in that. You do, yeah, you yeah, and you know, seeing if a certain crowd seems real laughy, you know, amp up the, the joke lines, and if they're more sedate or more contemplative, you know. Did you ever notice how it's monologist or monologist? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Boy, I'm tired. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so now with the full band, is, the, yeah. is, there, is that kind of less stressful then to be up there with more Strangely people? Strangely it is, yeah, right? Like, bringing myself around is terrifying. Um, it, was, it wasn't terrifying, it was high stakes and new. Uh, and then try working with these guys, I have like a three piece that I usually play with, and then um, Abby Wolf, who's this really stellar soprano, and she does really nice close harmonies, you know, really first rate vocalist. So here I, I, I do it so much more that I feel 
probably do it, yeah. Uh, you've talked about Castro the Twin, which you know takes some new arrangements of a badly, bo a badly broken code. You've talked about uh, that kind of diagnosing weaknesses on the previous record. What what were the weaknesses that you saw? And God, I don't remember talking about it so intense. <laughs> I let it all out during that interview. Um, what are the weaknesses on a badly broken code? Well, I think I found my voice a little bit more since then. I th I'm proud of that record, though, to be honest. Like, I'm really proud of that record. Nonetheless, when I listen back to it, are there moments where I think I'd be better prepared to like tackle those songs again? Yeah, for sure. But there's also some moments of just sort of like brazen, like I'm having fun and I'm not thinking too hard about it. Um, that I probably am less likely to be able to pull off successfully now. So I think it was more like allowing some of the vulnerabilities in, in those songs, in the lyrics of those songs, um, to be showcased in a different way that's like more at the fore. Because I think a lot of times when there's production, that's a big part of what you're hearing, you know, it's like a killer snare. And I, I dug making that record. And on the other hand, like performing that, some of that material on Caster the Twin, which is almost like a, I don't know, a, chamber pop record or something where I've got like classical sounds, you know, but backing rap music and not in a hybrid old way, I hope, in a natural way. Um, making that record ended up being a lot more like lyric based for me. You know, you really hear every word. The themes are really at the fore instead mm -hmm. of the production. So with the new stuff, do you want to continue to go in that direction, kind of be a little bit more, I mean, sure, less going on in some ways, more focused on the lyrics yeah. and, and how much does your participation in Doomtree uh, make you want to go to opposite sides of the spectrum? Like oh, this. that's a good question. Yeah, I think, I think in some ways, like, um, I do a little bit of writing on the page, which you mentioned. When I put out my first short book, I was so much happier in Doomtree. And I think it was because I was trying to write a book, like, in every rap song that I made, and then it wasn't a book, and I was pissed off. You know, <laughs> I was like, this isn't a book, this is just a song. And, <laughs> And then when I, I realized that, okay, well, you've got a, uh, an artistic appetite that you're not actually attending to at the moment, or you've got a drive that you're not, um, you're not doing the work to satisfy, that after I did the book, I was like, oh, fuck, I can just write good songs and have fun writing. This feels great, because I wasn't worried about that anymore, you know? Mm. And so I think in some ways, like, with Doomtree, like, if I'm looking for a two and a half hour set uh, where I'm sweating through my clothes and, you know, I'm done and it looks like, I mean, it looks like you've been in a dryer for two and a half hours. You know, just my hair is fucked up and I'm half drunk on whiskey and somebody hit my face and it's my not cut and my, my little cut. Okay, it's like, you know, you just tore up and it feels good. It feels athletic. It feels like adrenal and... That doesn't happen in a spoken word performance. Not likely, right? Unless something <laughs> went wrong. Uh, that was really creepy. Why am I sweating so yeah. much? Yeah. Sitting on I, a stool. I gotta go to the doctor. <laughs> uh, that said, so I think there probably are like some, you know, each one feeds a slightly different appetite. But the record that I finished, um, the record that comes out later this year, is I think because I now know, okay, this is what a rap beat does, and if I drop a snare, this is how that affects the song. Or if I put, uh, you know, kicks on two, on two and four instead of on one and three, you know, you just figure out how all the dials work in a rap song. Okay, and then I had like an organic record, and so now I can figure out what more of those dials do. Like, what's the difference between a viola and a violin? Wait, what's the difference between a four string? violin and a five string violin. Oh, that's how that sounds? Oh, okay, so it's like a, like kind of just deeper and woodier or something? Yeah, okay. Well, now I have that ammunition to, to like, when I sat down to write this most recent record, which doesn't have a name yet, to say, okay, what would best serve this song? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And it didn't feel like, oh, my direction is chamber experimental pop, you know, retro. And I wasn't like, okay, I'm a hip hop artist, stay in your lane. I was like, fuck a lane, man. Like, what would make this song good? The thing that would make like this that. song good is a produced snare and a five-string violin. Boom. Is there a, a sense of when that's coming out later this year? Uh, we're arguing about it now. Yeah, so. But like summer. But when the weather's warm. The weather's warm. I don't know how warm it will be or how long it will have been warm for. But. Okay. Uh, if you're willing to pat yourself on the back at all, I there are so many fantastic lyrics on your records. Thanks. I'm wondering if there's a line that comes to mind that when you wrote or that seems particularly meaningful or or just one of your favorites for some reason? Gorsh. Um, I don't know. There is a tune on the next record um, called Annabelle that I think was like the song in whole that I was most proud of. Um, 
actually was not going to sit here and recite three and a half minutes of lyrics. But that would be the tune and hole. And then another one that I dug was um, is a, your conscience is clean as a line of cocaine. Your conscience is clean and as white as a line of cocaine about uh, having a conversation with a friend about his drug use. And then um, anger is just love left out and gone to vinegar. All good. One I put down was you've got a lot of long answers to a lot of short questions. I Thanks. like that. Because um, I feel like lyrics like that actually make you extrapolate in hmm. really interesting ways and open to interpretation. Whereas, I mean, there's so many lyrics you listen to, they're just like, okay, it's about this one little thing, and that's kind of it. Yeah, totally. I think, like, there's a lot that I, to be totally frank, there's a lot about how I do my job that I am not yet satisfied with. Like, I really struggle. Um, sometimes on stage, sometimes in studio, you know, there's a lot of frustrations there, but the writing part, like, that part, I feel confident, you know, like, I, I was born to do something with words, and uh, now I've just got to learn how to do something with this, you know, so. Do you not feel as confident in your voice? Absolutely not. I think if, if, I, if I had the money, I don't even know if I would be singing my own songs. Like, if I could put really? together a show where I could, like, design the whole thing, you know, like, I would think I would sing a bunch of them, but there are some songs where, to me, they sound good. Let's say, uh, here's a human, like, uh, female vocalist's range, right? And let's say, here's where my range lives. There are some songs that just sound good and impactful, like, right here, because it's high tension and high drama. But I don't, you know, I don't have a limitless voice. I think I have a, a really vast imagination for lyricism, but I don't have a limitless voice. And so a lot of times it's like finding out what the instrument will let me do with the ideas, you know, where I think after a particularly tough song in the last record, I was talking to my guy, my boyfriend, I was just like, is it even, co like, could I have someone else sing this song and put it on my record? And he was like, I was like, that's weird as hell. And he was like, it certainly is. And I was like, okay, let's just think, is there a reason I couldn't do that? And he was like, no, technically not. I would say it's a last resort. And we listed a vocalist who I would hire, have her do it. And I was like, Word. I'm gonna go back in the studio. I'm gonna try to record this 22 more times, and then after that, I'm done. I'm not. I can't do it. I can't do the song justice. So. Mariah Carey wasn't interested. I'm waiting for the text. So <laughs> I didn't mean to open a raw nerve or something. Um, well, you wrote on Twitter, ballads and rap songs are not as different as good songs and bad songs. Why? Why did you feel that that needed to be? Said? <laughs> why the hell did you say that? Um. Probably because it, I was being a little self-obsessed and I, I know that a lot of what people say for good or bad, you know, about the, the kind of stuff I do is, has to do with genre. Either she's genre bending in a way that feels cool, right? Everyone likes to imagine that they're doing something innovative. On the other hand, like when I finished A Badly Broken Code, which was the first record that put me more in kind of a national, I don't want to say national caliber, but it, it was sent me around the country as opposed to just playing at home. Um, that even people on my team, you know, who, who are still on my team and who I really trust were voiced some concern like dude I think these are some pretty good songs on here you know could you do like two more song songs and then two more rap songs and you have two records just split them up you know you have the singing stuff and you have the rap stuff like at least ask people to wave their hands in the air you know whether they care or you, not you yeah, would just I mean, need could you, if I could just have some indication that you care with a, <laughs> with an airborne hand <laughs> Uh, that the label is talking. And yeah, and I could just, if I could just see your palm, that'd be, no. <laughs> but, but yeah, so I, I get it. I mean, in some ways I think we, you know, a, a singy song, right? A love song or a ballad. Like, I understand that that's a different thing than a rap song, but it doesn't feel like it's so alien, you know, that it can't coexist. If I've got something else that that's provides continuity, a sensibility, a, a lyrical style, you know, which... Be so it's not like I went song song broccoli song song. You know what I mean? <laughs> it was like good music, is, and I feel like when you make a mix, you know, if you meet a, a pretty girl in high school, or I meet a, a pretty boy in high school, and and you make a mix, you're not thinking, oh, this doesn't go. This is indie rock, and this is you know whatever, and this is folk. No, you just make sure that the shit sounds cool. Sure. Want to ask you a few quick ones? What's the uh, first album you remember buying? I think it was probably something by Offspring. But you have all the albums in camera. <laughs> which one you got first? No, I can't remember which one it was. Uh, How often do you listen to that now? Zero. <laughs> I listen to that zero. <laughs> Never. How about first concert? Uh, I think it was Joan Baez, and then shortly followed by uh, 
Uh, no doubt. Didn't the offspring open for Joan Baez at one point? <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah. Yes, they keep them separated to her. Featuring <laughs> Joan Baez. They do Please not follow their separated. own advice. Yeah, yeah exactly. no, seriously. So. What's a question you would be happy to never get again? Do you want me to answer honestly? Mm-hmm. That one. Really? Yes. No, but, sorry, it would be, what's a question that you're asked too often or something like that? It was the question that I'm asked too oh, often. Oh, okay. Yeah. I thought it would be something about Women. Women's role yeah. in hip hop. I would say five and... years ago, what's it like to have breasts and rap? I was like, God, it's crazy, you know? I, you I asked everyone believe that, it even, over here. even actors. <laughs> yes. I'm just like, what do you think that would be like? <laughs> yeah, carpenters, yeah. The guy who services my air conditioner. Um, yeah, I think uh, I think I answered a lot of questions about the, the women thing. And it used to bug me for a while, but I think maybe it's just a case of like every year. I've had something a little different to say about it, even even just because at first it didn't really affect my career at all, and then when you start taking photos for magazines, you know, the way that, it's a little different the way that Sims is treated and the way that I'm treated, for good right. reason or for bad, I don't know. And then once you start dealing with LA guys, then all this, the sliminess that I thought was just not part of the music industry as prominently as it was displayed in, you know, biopics about Cadillac Records back in the day or whatever, it's like, mom, it's not that slimy. And then you meet like LA and New York guys and it gets like, it's so insidious because they'll greet you, you know, and they'll touch you or something. But they don't say, like, you know, it's a casting couch. Like, I want to sign you, but first I have to see the goods. I don't say anything like that. But they just, their hands linger too long, and it's so, like, insidious that I don't know when to yell, you're touching me too long. And he's like, whoa. Because it's so casual, the way that the lines mm. become crossed. And that stunned me. I thought it, I was ready when I joined this business to be like, no, no. And then I found that, like, Sexism and misogyny and complicated gender roles came with a lot of otherwise really good people. I think anything with that in that sleazy tone of voice would be uncomfortable. Even if they said, I think your music is phenomenal, yeah, that would just be wrong. My wife loves your stuff. Like, <laughs> it's never a good voice. 